Do you wait for the next 9-11? After all, if they pull off one 9-11, <clears throat> can they pull off the next one? And what is the purpose of these? Um, it's very important. Um, do you, because these, the next one is predicted to be far worse than the last. So please speak out now, because a time comes when our silence is betrayal. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. time for your questions and you must have some. In the back here, hold up your, your mic real high, Mark, and is there one question? <coughs> right here, Rich has one. He's going to turn it on. Who's got the first question? There's one right here. And who on this side? Oh, over here. So we'll go on the right side first. Go ahead, Rich. Okay, we'll go over here where the microphone is working. Raise your hand again. Let's see if we can turn that sucker on. Speak real loud, I guess. Uh, excellent question, and it turns out that if you had access to the elevator hoistways uh, in, the, in the building, you would have access to the columns and beams immediately adjacent to them. And you could cut through the two layers of three-quarter inch gypsum board and plant all the explosives you want. And no one would see you. You'd make a, a stir. But say you had uh, the, you were operating under the guise of an elevator modernization plan which turns out to have been going on the nine months prior to 9-11. Documented wow. in Elevator World, March 2001. 85 employees, in fact, of Ace Elevator were in, in the building working on the, the, uh, the, this modernization. And they fled when the first jet planes hit. It was quite a scandal. USA Today documented it quite well. They're supposed to help the firefighters rescue the people. It didn't happen. So under the guise of an elevator modernization, the nine months prior to 9-11, it's completely plausible that that's a possibility. We don't know a real investigation would help us achieve answers. Is it working now? I think so. Check, yeah, check. talk right into the micro microphone. Hello. Is yours working, Rich? Check, check. There we go. Question over here. Please use the mic. So uh, we have like suicide bomber pilots. We have demolition people placing charges. We have demolition companies shipping demolition products by the boxcar load. We have coordination people. We have press releases. We have like literally potentially hundreds of people involved in this kind of a uh, orchestrated demolition. Why haven't any of those people on their deathbed or in their conscious? What's their motivation? Someone's going to get like a million dollars to participate. Where's the human side? of the equation. Why hasn't someone spoke, spoken up? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. And I, I certainly have the same question. Uh, we don't know that they haven't spoken up. We do know that there's no audience for us who has the physical evidence, let alone them. And if you did speak up, you could be put in jail for mass murder, after all. Maybe some of them get a conscience, right? And they just need to say something. But there's not an environment. We're called kooks. And we're technical building professionals. What are they going to be called? Uh, there's, there's just no support for, for these people to show up. And we don't know how many of them may still be alive also. There's a whole lot of possible answers. But that's all involving speculation, isn't it? So uh, while they're fair questions, uh, we're successful in avoiding them. Uh, and as a result, they don't call us conspiracy theorists. So they try to. But what we have is evidence. I'm sure everybody would like to know some clarity on the aircraft, exactly what was going on. A little louder. I know everyone would like to know and have clarity on the aircraft, what exactly occurred. How did they arrange that? How did they arrange the aircraft? Where did they go? Okay. What happened to them? So many of us assume that the hijackers were on the aircraft. 
And we, all, the only evidence we have for that comes from our government. We know our government lied about Iraq. <laughs> we know they lied about these building demolitions. What else are they lying about? Uh, we don't know. Um, we do know that airplanes can be remotely controlled. That technology exists. And we do know that the hijackers didn't really have qualifications to run these uh, these the, uh, these uh, airliners because they were failing Cessna school. Uh, <clears throat> so these are the kinds of things David Ray Griffin talks about that we really try to avoid. I'm just giving you some possible ways to research. Next question. <laughs> I've heard some discussion that thermite may have been incorporated in the building when they wanted to demolish that. Now, was that a good idea? Only once? Was there any precedent for thinking that far ahead in the 70s? Oh, you mean built? in the 60s when it was built? Yeah. Uh, unlikely, uh, particularly nanothermite, <clears throat> which has only developed in the last 10 years or so. <clears throat> I don't think thermite would have lasted 30 years. Um, but I've heard the same theory. A real investigation would help us to understand uh, a lot of these things. Oh, it does before in another building, right? I mean, oh, thermite has not been used, to our knowledge, to bring down high-rise or any other building. This is a new type of demolition. What? Incorporated into the construction? No. Not to my knowledge. Not to anybody else have heard of such a thing? No. You're next. You'll be next. Here's the next uh, mark over here, but you go ahead. Um, I heard Dick Cheney took um, control of North American Aerospace Defense on the day of 9-11. Is that true? Yes, it is true. And, and uh, David Ray Griffin's books talk about that as well. Okay. Uh, you, you, you know, you can speculate as to whether that was unusual or not, and there's a lot of discussion you can get into about it, but it is true. Uh, can we, Mark, where are you? Okay, here, and then come up front. We'll get two of these folks up front. Hi, um, you had asked earlier, when would they find the time to place those charges in those buildings? Um, I don't, how many people know, uh, do you know that uh, George W. Bush's cousin was in charge of the uh, Harbor Patrol, which subsequently was in charge of those buildings, and two months prior to that, they were running evacuations on those buildings? Well, let, let, let's take it step by step. There's a security company in charge of the security, the World Trade Center, electronic security, that's called Securicon, changed names to Stratosec. We want an investigation of the security company, obviously, because you can't just do anything like this in a building without approval from the security company. There's some very interesting characters on the boards of the directors of those companies. Uh, so we want a real investigation. Uh, now go ahead and ask the second part. Also, um, I was wondering how many people here have, had, have heard the name Larry Silverstein? Uh, I have. <laughs> okay. Um, Larry Silverstein on his one and only uh, interview on television. Let, let me just play it rather than tell everybody <laughs> what he said. Uh, some people um, would really like to hear this firsthand, I am sure. Uh, and, and it is very interesting. Larry Silverstein purchased the buildings. Uh, the he was uh, he actually he was leased the buildings in a 99-year lease, and that paperwork only went through <clears throat> six weeks prior to 9/11, changing hands from public to private, from very suspicious uh, set of bidding circumstances as well. Now, after the buildings came down, uh, oh, by the way, he purchased them with investing only 125 million of his own money for a 3.5 billion, is it? Is it is it's a huge leverage deal, and um, he's now collected $5.6 billion uh, from his insurance company. And so, I mean, he's, he's sitting